coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. What I find is that most private landowners, if they know they have spook foxes, they really like them. They're kind of cute and charismatic. What we're going to see, we don't know until we get down there. Every dive is, a, is an experience. You can't beat the color of an Altamira Oriole or a green jay. They're just wonderful to see. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Hi, I'm Carter Smith, the Executive Director of the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. I'm delighted to welcome you to the 36th season of the Texas Parks and Wildlife television show. For decades, this program has taken viewers all across our home ground to help showcase the lands and waters and fish and wildlife and parks and places that help make Texas so special. Enjoy the show. Come on, buddy. These researchers are transferring a wild animal from box trap to bag. Keep going. They can't really see it, on, but this critter is always hard to see, especially in Texas. Down here in the southern part of their range, the densities appear to be pretty low. What I'm trying to do is get his head in the corner so that it's easier to grab without getting bitten. There we go. This is one of the smallest species of the wild dog family in North America, a swift fox. And these researchers are happy to find it in good health on this lonesome prairie in the far north panhandle. First things first, hair dye. Those teeth look smooth. This team is studying the status of this elusive little fox to help keep it on the grasslands of the Great Plains. We are Operation Fox Finder. OK, guys, your maps are ready. My name's Donnie Schwal. So here's camp. My job description is research associate. I go a little bit further in the road bend at the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife at Oregon State University. Wow. But try and stay south of the road. We're looking right. for swift foxes. There you go. Very cool. Okay. Appreciate it. We're working with Texas Parks and Wildlife to survey for swift foxes in a nine county area in the Texas Panhandle that falls within the historic distribution of this species. This species, from what we can tell from historic records, is almost gone. We know for sure there's been a big decline historically. About 50% of their historic distribution now no longer has swift foxes. And where they do still exist, the population is kind of patchy, so it's not very continuous. We think that the first and foremost thing that led to these major population declines were historic predator control programs, where they were poisoning kind of indiscriminately for wolves mostly and really just anything. And unfortunately, those baits, they're not specific. And we ended up with a lot fewer foxes that way. Of course, they like grassland habitat. The more agricultural development there is, especially if it's like irrigated farmland, the fewer swift foxes there will be. And then finally, primarily because there's no more wolves, there's way more coyotes than there used to be. And coyotes are their highest source of mortality, up to 77% of their mortality. So it's a pretty big deal. habitat in the Texas Panhandle tends to be centered in like the national grassland system right along the Oklahoma and New Mexico borders and then quite a bit of private land too. There's a lot of cattle ranchers that have good habitat. They want that short vegetation. I work with a lot of private landowners and they always want to know if this is going to affect their operation. And the first thing I tell them is that this is not an endangered species. But the second thing is that if they're grazing their pastures, they're doing swift foxes a favor. So the only thing we would ask is, you know, please don't shoot them. What I find is that most private landowners, if they know they have swift foxes, they really like them. They're kind of cute and charismatic. I'd keep it on this side. So. All right. We're doing two different things while we're here. Our primary task is to set cameras but we're also doing some live trapping. 
because we want to collect a genetic sample to look at the genetic viability of this population. All right, ready for the poll? Yeah. I'm doing a grid study with wildlife cameras. Stop! 16. What that means is we have multiple wildlife cameras per area rather than just one. That increases the chances of seeing our focal species, the swift fox. Eight. Got it. We use a paste bait. It's very, very skunky. Nasty. <laughs> Pungent. <laughs> the way we've got it set up, we've got a scent post three meters out from the camera and a bunch of other smelly stuff near that scent post. And they'll smell the post. Sometimes they'll mark the post. They'll roll in the lure and kind of hang out in front of the camera for a little while and tootle off. Mostly we get coyotes and badgers and skunks and porcupines and pronghorn and all kinds of birds and all kinds of raptors and crows and vultures and everything but a fox. <laughs> we must be close to 200 cameras out and zero fox. But we were surveying where they haven't been seen since the 80s. So I can't say we're surprised. I'm going to be really disappointed if we're setting cameras all in this area where they should be and we don't get them. So the daily schedule is pretty much all day. As soon as we're done checking our trap line, not today. Then we're setting cameras all day long until three or four in the afternoon and we start resetting our traps. Yeah, I don't know. It's not really an exact science. How dry is the brisket chunk? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe if we can get ourselves a roadkill deer, the rest of the brisket will go in our bellies. The glories of wildlife biology. Only put the rabbit in a spot that you think is just amazing. Huh? Let's get some foxes in boxes. We're going to go back to that really short stuff. So this is a really exciting place to set traps. The vegetation is almost like a golf course. They like it six inches or less, and this is probably some of the best stuff that we've found so far since it's a wet year. Maybe everything's so tall. Here. OK. There we go. You got all the GPS and stuff? Yep. OK, we're done. I think we've got a good chance of a fox. Still no fox sign, though, which is a bummer. Lots of coyote tracks and some coyote scats. So we'll see. Right. Put our last two right around here. There's a little prairie dog town over there and some trails, so fingers crossed. I'm excited. We got enough sunlight left to get home in time to cook something instead of just eat cold soup. <laughs> Even though the swift fox is not federally endangered, it's still a species of concern that we want to help. Their habitat is going away and they don't have anywhere to live. And so I'm hoping that as we talk with the public and help them understand what is happening, they can help with our efforts. 29 degrees this morning. You gotta take your time or you're gonna leave your oil pan somewhere in the middle of a pasture. Nobody came to say hello. Uh... So this one's empty. Shoot! There's another one down there. You know, they talk about this like a flyover land, and I always like, well, that's because you haven't spent any time in it. You don't listen to the metal lark chorus in the morning, so I think they're missing out. Grasslands are, are so underappreciated because there's a lot of really unique species here that, that occur here and nowhere else. We've lost a lot of it, but there's a lot of opportunity left to like conserve these unusual species that only occur here. Ooh, it does look closed. It does look closed. It's closed. Okay, it's a moment of truth. Please don't be a skunk. This one has me nervous. It's a fox. <laughs> it's a fox. And he tore part of the plastic off the trap so I could see him. All right, we got one. Let's text the crew. To be able to see one in hand is really rewarding. You're really surprised at how small they are. 2.3 kilograms. 
you know? It's like the Fox's version of alien abduction. Probed and prodded and measured. Two inches. To keep the eyes covered, they stay kind of calm and there's no evidence it affects them in the long term. I want to help fix things. I want to work with the landscape, I want to work with the landowners to see if we can like put some things to rights where we can. And, and Swift Foxes provide that opportunity to like put something back on the landscape and restore the species and they're a neat little animal. tough little guys and I can appreciate that. That's the best part. Turn them loose and they always put on a nice little show. Away I go, back to life. Had a girl. Trot off and they stop and they look at you and have a little bathroom break and go on their way. Good luck, honey. In the Gulf waters off the Texas coast, these divers are on their way to visit an artificial reef. What we're gonna see, we don't know until we get down there. It's amazing and really exciting. I get, it's like my inner nerd comes out. Not just any reef, it's an old ship called the Kraken that's quickly becoming a new Texas legend. Parks and Wildlife Artificial Reef Program out here today to create our latest artificial reef. We're at our reef site, 65 miles out of Galveston, getting ready to reef this ship called the Kraken. We're trying to maneuver into a deep water spot that's at least 140 feet deep. Named after the mythical sea monster, the Kraken is one of the largest ships to be reefed off the Texas coast. Well, in the Gulf of Mexico, the, the bottom is mainly mud and sand. There's not a lot of hard substrate for marine organisms and invertebrates to attach to. This is why we put these out here. Our, our mission is to uh, create and enhance a marine habitat in the Gulf of Mexico. And one way we do that is using materials such as ships. Conditions are perfect. It's nice, it's two to three foot rollers out here, the sun's shining. It's a really good day for reefing. With four large holes cut into the stern of either side of the ship, the Kraken will sink by what's called a controlled flood. Water will rush into the stern, and we're hoping that the stern touches the bottom first, and all that superstructure will fill with water, and it'll bring the bow down nice and slow. The Kraken sinks perfectly and lands dead level on the sea floor. I don't know if we're going to get that GoPro back. It's been seven months, and it's coated. There's a lot of fish on that ship. Massive, massive schools of bait fish, mostly mackerel scad, uh, lots of red snappers. 
I wasn't expecting it to proliferate that much that quickly after sinking. It's really cool. It only takes a, a few months to get a significant amount of marine growth. We did a lot of pre-survey work before the ship was reefed, found uh, a couple of sharks and not much of anything else. No red snapper, no other reef species. And now it's just teeming with marine life. The divers really loved Rex. Every dive is, a, is an experience because even if you've seen the wreck before, you're guaranteed to see something different each time you go down. The site's really nice. We designed it specifically to be easily accessible. Swimming through the bridge, easy. You can go through the lower levels as well if you're comfortable with it and you have more training. The cranes are there. We've got uh, the anchor. The prop is on there if you can get down that far to look at it. Back on the surface, the team has more work to do. We're doing vertical longline fishing. Can you pass me the eight? We catch a, a number of different species, but most of what we're catching is red snapper. We want to know the age of the snapper that are living on these structures. We also want to know if they're traveling between the structures. Fishing. fishing. We'll drop one line at a time. We soak it for five minutes. All right, guys, get ready. Get ready. All of the fish get measured. 343. Okay. They get tagged. Tag number 417. And then they all get released. Line three, ginormous red snapper. Today, we caught over a dozen snapper. That red snapper is enormous. This is 4.6. Nice work, everyone. Teamwork. All right, which one are we dropping next? Releasing the fish at the right depth is critical to recompressing their swim bladder. We use these really interesting hooks called sequelizers, and they have a pressure sensor on them. They're set to 100 feet, so when the line goes and it reaches 100 feet, the pressure release lets go and the hook comes undone and the fish swims off. Adult red snapper live mostly near structures in deep water. That's a red snapper. They've long been a popular catch for both recreational and commercial fishermen. Reefs like the Kraken are helping build a sustainable red snapper population. When fishermen target these structures, they're taking fishing pressure off of the natural reefs. All of these natural reefs that have been the basis of production for economically important fish, like the snapper, well now the pressure is kind of getting relieved because, oh, well now we can go to the Kraken. Considering the ship has only been down here for six months, it's got a lot of productivity going on. We're really happy with the way it's progressing. I don't think it really could have gone any better than what it's showing up to be. It looks great. It's just amazing in such a short period of time how the ocean finds a way. Wish you could spend more time with nature? Well, every month you can have the great outdoors delivered to you. Since 1942, Texas Parks and Wildlife Magazine has been the outdoor magazine of Texas. Every issue is packed with outstanding photography and writing about the wild things and wild places of this great state. And now Texas's best outdoor magazine is available as an app. It's just that easy. Texas Parks and Wildlife Magazine, your connection to the great outdoors. Oh, 
hold in front of a woodpecker on the orange over there. Now, one thing you need to, that you need to practice with your binoculars, you need to practice pulling up the binoculars and having what you want to see in your field of vision. So we're going to practice with this hummingbird feeder. That is a skill that bird watchers have to have. Mr. Conway kind of got us all into birding. He's a really big uh, naturalist person. We asked him to create a team, and we we're now a birding team for our, our school. It helps a lot to like intertwine the hands-on visual scene and learning with like our curriculum. It's quite the move there. Yeah. There's good movement there. there. Ooh. Ooh. That was close. Look at that. This is a really good park for people who aren't real knowledgeable about nature. They can come out, they can see a lot of birds. There are over 500 species of birds in this ecoregion alone. A lot of the birds here are very colorful. You can't beat the color of an Altamira Oriole or a Green Jay. They're just beautiful birds. They're just wonderful to see. Okay, look right here. Look right here, guys, come look. Ooh, look on the ground, right there at the end of that stump there, there's a common paraki. He's sleeping on the ground, everybody see it? Looks just like the leaf litter, it's a beautiful bird. Nice. We invite them to come in and enjoy themselves for breakfast in the morning. <laughs> I'm Paul Love. I'm a, uh, just a volunteer here with the Audubon Society. They give me funds to purchase feed for the birds. I keep them fed and uh, they enjoy it and I enjoy it. It has sunflower seed, has peanut butter, cornmeal, oatmeal, anything I can find to put into it that I know they're going to like. You can hear him, he's hungry. <laughs> There's stuff in the trees. Look, 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 look. There's like eight of them. Look who's on the corn on the cob. A green jay. Look at that. Whoa, get it. <laughs> That's awesome. That I can go to the outdoors and have something to do. And it's something, um, you know, it's kind of relaxing and peaceful. You can just need your binoculars and you can do it anywhere. So that's what I like about it. And you know, the birds are neat, you know, to see different birds. Hey, look at all those chachalacas sitting there. It's not very bright, but I like the noise it makes. It'd be a good ringtone, wouldn't it? Yeah. Chachalaca, chachalaca, chachalaca. <laughs> My favorite probably is the green jay. I know that's kind of like the, the hallmark of South Texas down here. Everybody will come from miles around just to see that bird. It's just cool. A lot of them are, are like camouflage or blending in, but that one really pops out. See the Altamira Oriole there? It's beautiful. Look how orange and black. And that's just down here in South Texas. I actually enjoy being outside and looking at nature. Now it flew away from the feeder. There's all kinds of different species, so they're they have different colors or different bills or they're just larger or smaller. Oh, on this right hummingbird feeder is another golden front woodpecker. You see it? Yes. Drinking that sweet nectar. When you see the top of the head, see that little red top, red spot on the top of the head? That's a male. That's pretty clever. <laughs> wow, there's a lot more birds than I like realized. So now I'm like looking at birds more, I guess, than I had before. So it's it's fun. <laughs> This is South Texas, it's Mother Nature. Yeah, it? Kids need to understand that and learn how Mother Nature uh, provides for everybody out here. That's our show for this week. We hope that you've learned a little bit more about the wild things and wild places of Texas. Thanks for watching.